Hi guys, it's Sophie from In The Mess. Today I'm going to talk you through how to do an ABCDE assessment. So the point of doing an ABCDE assessment is it is a structured way to assess patients who are acutely unwell so that you can find the most life-threatening pathologies first and you have a chance to correct those problems before you move on to something which may be more obvious or distracting. To start your ABCDE assessment, you would first look at the airway. One of the easiest ways to assess a patient's airway is to speak to your patient. If someone can speak back to you, then you know that they have got a patent airway. Patients who are conscious, who have a partially or fully obstructed airway, will look very distressed as a result of this. When you're assessing an airway, you need to look at the way the patient is breathing to see if there's any use of accessory muscles, anything like tracheal tug or intercostal recession, which suggests an increased work of breathing. Listen for any additional sounds, strider, wheezing, that might indicate a partially obstructed airway. The worst thing you could possibly hear is nothing at all, as this would indicate that you have a fully obstructed airway. In any patient where you are concerned about partial or complete airway obstruction, ensure you call for help early. Particularly, you want to make sure that anaesthetics are coming to help you in case this patient needs to be intubated. Start with simple manoeuvres like a head tilt or a chin lift, and if this doesn't work, you can try a jaw thrust. You need to apply 10 to 15 litres of high flow oxygen, either through a non-rebreather mask or through a bag valve mask. If your patient's airway does not clear with simple airway manoeuvres, you can use adjuncts like oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airways. These are best used in patients with low levels of consciousness, as a patient who has a GCS roughly higher than 8 is probably not going to tolerate an oropharyngeal airway. You can always take it out if your patient is coughing or gagging. To assess breathing, there's a few sources of information that you need to look for. Look at the patient's respiratory rate. A normal rate is between about 12 and 20. An increased respiratory rate can be a subtle sign which tells you that there's something deeply wrong. The other thing you want to look for is your patient's saturations. You can get this through a pulse oximeter. Normal saturations sit in the range of 94 to 98%. If your patient's saturations are below 94%, you want to put oxygen onto your patient. Again, in an emergency situation, I would go for a non-rebreather mask running at 10 to 15 litres of oxygen. For many patients this will probably be too much oxygen, but you can titrate this down as the situation improves. The last thing you want is to not be giving your patient enough oxygen and for them to get progressively more and more hypoxic and end up having a hypoxic cardiac arrest. You also want to auscultate your patient's chest to see if you can get any clues as to why they're in respiratory distress. Do they have one-sided harsh crepitations that might suggest they've got pneumonia? Have they got reduced breath sounds and hyperresonance on percussion on one side, which might suggest they have a pneumothorax? Don't forget to do things like chest expansion and examine the ribs, particularly in patients who've had trauma to their chest, to look for any signs of rib fractures. You may need to do some additional investigations like a chest x-ray or potentially an arterial blood gas to further investigate your patient's breathing problems. You might be concerned about patients with type 2 respiratory failure. There is a group of patients, particularly patients with COPD, who normally rely on a hypoxic drive to breathe. For these patients, treating them aggressively with oxygen may take away their hypoxic drive to breathe. This can lead to increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the bloodstream and respiratory acidosis. If you're not sure whether or not your patient is in this group, the best thing to do is to assume that they're not. Even in these patients, hypoxia will kill them faster than the hypercapnia does. So you should put the oxygen on and aim for normal SATs and then get a blood gas and try and work out what's going on. For more information on this, you can see our oxygen video. In your circulation assessment, you need to again look for parameters like your blood pressure and your heart rate. A systolic blood pressure below 90 and a heart rate above 90 suggests that your patient has circulatory compromise. This can come from a number of causes, including dehydration, bleeding, sepsis, anaphylaxis, and many others. When you're doing your circulation assessment, look for any obvious causes of bleeding, assess for capillary refill time, feel your patient's extremities, their feet, and their legs for temperature, and look for any signs of mottling. You want to get IV access, place a cannula, and take some blood tests off at the same time if you can. The exact blood tests that you want will vary, but just try and get as many as you can off the back of your cannula. Once you've got IV access, if you have any signs of circulatory compromise, you want to give your patient a fluid challenge. For more information, you can see our fluids video. But in general, 250 to 500 ml of crystalloid solution is an adequate fluid challenge and assess the results. Don't forget to auscultate your patient's heart, 
and do an ECG to look for any cardiac cause of their circulatory compromise. D stands for disability. In disability, you want to assess your patient's conscious level. This can be done in two ways. In an emergency, it's acceptable to assess your patient using the AVPU scale. Are they alert? Are they responsive to voice, responsive to pain or unresponsive? If you have more time or are practiced at using it, you can do a formal GCS. In any patient with an altered mental status, consider whether there might be a toxidrome relating to this. Have a look at the drug cardex and see whether or not anything has been given to the patient, including opioids or benzodiazepines, which might be impairing their conscious level, as these are easily reversible. Most importantly, don't ever forget glucose. Hypoglycemia is an easily reversible cause of altered mental state. In E, exposure, you're trying to get any additional information that you can. Don't forget to check your patient's temperature, but also have a look at any body systems that you haven't examined so far, including the abdomen. You do need to fully expose your patient, but do this in a manner which preserves their dignity and comfort. Have a look for rashes and make sure that you examine any attachments coming off your patient, including pre-existing intravenous lines, catheters or drains. Once you've finished your ATE assessment, if you've made any interventions for your patients, such as starting oxygen or giving fluids, you need to go back and reassess how these interventions are working and whether further intervention is required. You should come up with a working diagnosis for your patient and you need to remember to escalate to your seniors using a structured method such as an S-bar. You also need to document your assessment clearly in the patient's notes, along with your working diagnosis and the plan for management. That is a very whistle-stop tour for how to do an A to E assessment. It's worth practicing these as they can be very useful in an emergency and you get more slick the more you practice them. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss a thing.